I started having transcendental experiences shooting me up into these higher realms and higher dimensions. And then I started working with my patients and they started getting better faster and they started waking up. Everything that I teach is about embodiment and building circuits. The more circuits you build, the more you ground and anchor the expansions that are occurring in your consciousness. One of the first things that I like to encourage people to do is to when we start to enliven this central channel in the body, we start to enhance the highest by Eastern culture used to reference this as the Shashumna. Ancient Egypt referenced it as the river of life. That is the Holy Grail. That is the fountain of youth. It's truly the eternal part of us. We are a descended master and we are rising into the full expression of that mastery that we already are. It doesn't happen until you're ready, until you can handle it and it happens when you're ready in order to refine you and your tendency to wanted to zoom out and just sort of talk about the collective shift that's currently underway that you see going on in the world. Um, do you see that there is a collective shift? I might be putting words in your mouth, maybe you can debunk whether there is or is it. I think there is. Um, and if there is, can you describe the nature of it a little bit to us um, and what you see and feel that is happening in the world at this time? Sure. Many things are happening, but it kind of boils down to one thing. There's an awakening going on and some people are aware of that and able to steward it with consciousness. And some people are unaware of it. And so what is occurring is those that are not aware of what's going on or dialed in at all are having an up-leveling in their consciousness without recognition. And what happens as a byproduct of that is our unresolved stuff starts floating to the surface because the vibration of humanity is, is up-leveling. And so if we don't know what to do with that stuff when it starts to surface, uh, we just project it onto someone else again. And so that contributes to the friction and the conflict that we are experiencing in so much of humanity when we look into the happenings around the world and what's going on. And so inside of that, um, there's a balancing and a harmonizing of the left brain and the right brain and the autonomic nervous system is starting to regulate or wanting to regulate. And if someone finds that uncomfortable, if they find an anxious feeling going on and they don't know what to do with that, as I said, they just turn, they assign a meaning to it and they decide that they're angry about something or frustrated about something or anxious about something. And it's all just because there's an energy rising in the system that they're unfamiliar with and their mind is assigning a negative meaning to it instead of just training, being trained to stay with it and to birth it and to come to know it and to become harmonic with it and resonant with it and then turn it into something that serves our greater capacity to make you know, decisions and to, to be able to vision for our lives and to be able to allow for um, the transmutation of, of issues from our past. And so, so we're waking up and some of us know how to handle it and some of us don't. And we're here to help everybody who wants to handle it um, well and responsibly and successfully and efficiently to find very accessible ways to do so. And so I think it's a good thing that's going on in humanity today. I think it's a beautiful opportunity for us to wake up and not be living as the false self, the personality, the ego, the fear-based version of reality, and to realize that we're at choice. We can move out of that and into something more authentic, which is based in wholeness instead of based in fear and lack and so forth. So there's a long answer yeah. to your question. But no, I think you've done it. I, I think you've mastered it, keeping it concise to be honest, actually. <laughs> there um because yeah the the and the unresolved stuff, is that what we refer to as shadow work, would you say? Is that one and the same to some degree? I think you use the word unresolved stuff. Um it sounds a bit more um accessible and egalitarian and a bit less like, ooh, <laughs> unresolved and makes it a bit more approachable. <laughs> but is that is that similar to what you're referring to? Yeah. It's anything that the that our conscious, intentional mind has not landed on and embraced is shadow. It's, it's still in the dark. The light of our consciousness hasn't shown on it yet. It is, we push things into that unconscious when something happens and it's bigger than we know what to do with. So we just shut it down below the level of the consciousness, stop thinking about it, go on, years go by, and there it is. So it's really about opening and allowing. You know, there's a 
there's kind of a trap door between the conscious mind and the subconscious. And it's supposed to be open and uh, regulating itself in this way. And what happens is we oftentimes get overwhelmed with things that are bigger than what we think we can handle. And it has an overriding effect on this trap door and sort of slams it shut and it gets locked or stuck or basically the communication between these two areas of the brain, the thalamus and the hypothalamus, stop talking to each other. And that can't happen because that is relative to our internal world and our out in our external world, our outer world. And if they're not talking to each other, then we're having inappropriate responses to our immediate environment. An example of that would be a person who tries to go on vacation and enjoy themselves and can't. They're just uptight all the time. Or the person who tries to sit down and watch a movie, but they fall asleep the minute that they do because their system is stuck in fight or flight and they're exhausted, their adrenals. And, and so the moment that, that it looks like it's safe from the bear, they just call it conk out trying to recover. And so lots of examples like that, that we can, that we can delve into. But, but the bottom line is we're here to shine the light on everything, on all of it, on all of us, to be free, to be revealed, to be transparent, to be liberated is to not have to hide some of that stuff, not have to develop, develop a false version of myself, making it look like I'm completely resolved. There's nothing in there. No, never mind the man behind the curtain kind of thing. It's really, uh, we're here to pull the curtain back and let's see what's here and let's accept it and embrace it and love into it and let it be a, a contributing part of our, our better selves rather than trying to continue to operate in some altered state that is compromised in some way. There is often that um that trippy dippy thing as well, which is like when you start looking at some of your stuff, it from afar looks like it smells really bad, but as you get closer, it's actually never as bad as you really think it is. You know, even sometimes you have to exercise forgiveness for yourself or towards others, or sometimes you need to have a conversation around forgiveness with the other, and it's like, oh, am I going to have that chat? And then you end up having that chat, and you're like, oh my god, that was nowhere near as hard as I ever thought it was going to be, but it was such a blessing to have that chat. Um, yeah, just uh, the work can feel so intimidating. And yet it, um, it, once you, you can, I don't want to say it becomes addictive because it's still, it still is, there is still fear around there, but, um, it can be extremely rewarding, um, in that space. One of the questions I had is around the fact that, um, I've come into my awareness recently and I'd love to get your insights on this because I know so much of your work also has this, um, this awareness around the body work is that the body or the mind and the system around the mind uh, and I might be wrong as I'm sharing this, so please correct me if I am, um, that the mind actually prefers to deal with things physically rather than having to look at emotions. And so it would escape looking at emotions like, let's say, anger by just manifesting something like back pain. And then you can just deal with like, as you just like walk around with back pain forever, never really having to look at your anger because it's like, in, there's almost like that trapdoor effect like you were describing before, which is like instead of having to look at deep emotions, which, you know, are suppressed and repressed, they just have these physical manifestations, which we walk around as like, oh, I've got an achy back or my knees are out um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's been quite a remarkable sort of awareness shift that's happened for me personally. And maybe you can speak to it. Maybe you can clear it out if it's wrong. Um, your awareness on the body uh, basically manifesting energetics within it um, that are speaking deeply to emotions and then also why we sort of focus on the physical as well because it's easier to deal with physical ailments than it is emotional ailments for the mind? Mm. Well, th yes, there are, there are certain uh, easier components to dealing with the physical world than it is dealing with the feeling word, world. Um, people are afraid of being hurt again. They're, they're afraid of the pain, the emotional pain that they have felt that is basically inherent in our existence here. When we land here, there is a, a cataclysmic uh, conversion of energies that happens to take place in an instant. It's upon arrival. And I oftentimes refer to that as a big splat. You know, we just sort of splat in this big bang moment. And what happens is the mind and the body and the breath, they sort of separate and they disintegrate. And so, so now we usually are identifying as the mind and we think that's who we are. And, and so the mind and the body and the breath are not working together. And so what we have to do is pull them back together if we ever actually want to be whole. So one of the things that the mind does in that splatted state is it will suppress anything that it doesn't want to experience. 
and it doesn't want to feel these emotions or it doesn't want to go into the unknown in some way. It wants to control things. And so it shoves it down. And then in terms of what happens neurologically and what happens as a relay system inside of the electromagnetic relationship with the nervous system is that that unresolved emotion is energy that's now been pocketed off and suppressed. And that packet of energy is, it has to go somewhere because the, the universe abhors a vacuum where we're sealing off energy. It wants flow to be happening and rejuvenation and re repeating and, and moving this energy. And so when we stymie it and create a package of it, that package is going to implode or explode at some point, depending on the amount of pressure on the inside or on the outside. You just think of it that way. And so what happens is the energy has to go somewhere. It can't be contained. And so it gets diffused into the cellular structure. And if it's a particular type of emotion, it affects particular vibrational frequencies within the body, like anger our frustration or fear, they each affect us differently. So it will show up in different areas of the body because the body is a reflection of different levels of consciousness. So if we're not dealing with the emotion, it shows up in the body because that energy has to be spent. It has to go somewhere. So it diffuses into the physical tissues. It's not so much that the mind is saying on any sort of conscious level, uh, I don't want to deal with that feeling, so I'm just going to create some knee pain so that I actually have something to be angry about. I'm angry about my knee pain when actually I was just angry, right? I was choosing anger instead of choosing peace or instead of working through a situation or instead of resolving or forgiving or doing the work. Um, you know, it, it, it unconsciously creates a pain pattern somewhere in the body. And then the mind has something to be afraid of or something to be angry at. It's creating a place to disperse or to project the energy so that um, it feels resolved and the body will bear the brunt until it can't. But for you know, 40 or 50 years, it will bear the brunt. It will take the load. Um, but then at about age 50, it's like, hey, you know, our resources are getting used up here. How many more times are you going to do this? I'm exhausted. I'm inflamed. You know, you need to take care of me. And that's when pain patterns and disease conditions and cellular collapse starts to take place, which we could completely prevent. And we can reverse it uh, once it has already, you know, defaulted into that system. So my short answer to your question is yes. <laughs> I'm glad you gave me the long answer because it actually blew my mind. Um, and the reason it blew my mind is because we started the podcast talking about collective shifts and then how you mentioned that we end up not being able to look at our shadow stuff, our unresolved stuff, and we end up projecting that on the other. And this was like within our system when you mentioned mind, body, breath, um, we end up projecting almost into onto the body um, so that – and that was really profound to hear that we're doing what we do on the macro – also on the micro within our systems. I do want to ask about how we start commencing the journey into energetic housekeeping. I know everybody's itching to hear about that, but also like I, just before we do, and uh, I'm conscious that we started this podcast quite macro, but also just addressing like your story a little bit because, yeah, just how did energy medicine wasn't a thing when you started doing all of this like 25, 30 years ago. <laughs> like now people talk about energy medicine, like it's more of a common thing, but even just energy and medicine and pairing those two things together. Um, yeah. How did, how, how did Sue become Sue? What's like, what's going on in there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. So I was raised in a conversation about quantum science and the effects on health, the power of choice and the power of thought and and subconscious interferences, meaning that which is not consciously resolved gets suppressed. So my father was a pioneer in what is now called energy medicine. So I was raised with it. So I've been 60 years in this conversation. I've been in it, right? So dinner table conversation, that's where we were. That's what we were, you know, we were exploring life from that perspective. So, so I came upon it honestly. And then I started having transcendental experiences um, with, when I, I began to develop headaches. And so I started, I went to learn to meditate to see if I could do something about my headaches. And 
uh, I was just drawn to learn to meditate. And the moment I started meditating, I started having transcendental experiences just shooting me up into these higher realms and higher dimensions. And it was crazy making because I was trained as a doctor and you do these certain things and you have these certain outcomes and here's where we're working. And I was aware of energy medicine and thoughts and how that affects our physiology and our pain patterns that we were describing. But I didn't have any idea about this alternate universe that I could these be living visceral in. experiences. <laughs> yes, these, these transcendental, truly out-of-body uh, cosmic experiences. And so I started having them instantly without the use of, you know, any medications or any any um, any shamanic journeys or anything like that. It was just happening. And so I became very curious as to what was going on and why and how I could benefit from these transcendental truly multidimensional experiences. And so like, why is this happening? What am I supposed to do with it? How does it affect people's well-being and their health and their vitality and their level of peace? Because that was the work that I was in. So I had to imagine that, that it was supposed to point in some direction of, of facilitating what my purpose on the planet was. And so I began experimenting with what it took for me to have those experiences on command. And I would try, I would use my will, I would just do, you know, and nothing. And then when I would stop trying, it would happen again. And so I realized, okay, there's another way of approaching this that might be a little bit more effective. So I have to try, but not try. I have to focus, but not try. I have to intend and allow, and then it will. And it did. And so after about five years of working with the details, the refined details of the exact kinds of energies that had been present with me when those kinds of things were happening, I had to recreate it. And I, I finally figured it out. And, and then I started working with my patients and my clients um, with, regarding that. And they started getting better faster. And they started staying better longer. And they started waking up to another version of themselves, not just the one who got rid of their shoulder pain or their back pain or their stomach problems, but, but a version of themselves that no longer was succumbing to victimization from a parental relationship or a, or a coach that had blown them away in the middle of some practice or, or a relationship that failed or it didn't fail, but it didn't work out the way they thought it was going to work. Um, and, and they started realizing that they were changing as a whole person instead of just treating symptoms or instead of just getting by or getting back to normal, they were finding new normals and they were up-leveling their life experience and their perceptive field was increasing and they were aware of so much more of life and possibility and opportunity and capacities. And so, um, and so it just became full steam ahead with me to keep exploring this and keep enhancing it. And so that's, that's how I've been spending the last 25 years um, consciously and intentionally working with showing people how to do this awakening and embodying thing so that we can benefit from all these transcendental experiences that everybody's wanting to have, uh, that we can have them and we can know what to do with them. That's, that's the key. And do you think those that of us that are able to learn to embody these practices, you mentioned earlier, and I had this connotation of in your response, uh, the word grace kept popping up. Um, do you think those that learn to embody these practices are afforded a little bit more grace in times of transition like we're going through now? Absolutely. There is such a flow and an opportunity to to literally see it from the bird's eye view, that these challenges that are happening for so much of humanity are actually opportunities for humanity to find a deeper version of themselves so that they too can be in this flow of grace that is allotted and is possible for all of us all the time, no matter what. And it is, it's a circuitry issue. It's, it is, it's literally an ability to translate the information of what's going on from a higher perspective. It's just like, you know, an elementary school child is going to have a particular experience of you know, a, a, a happening in their lives. And, and a 25-year-old a is going to see that same happening and interpret it completely differently because they have more experience and that experience has allotted them more neurocircuitry to reference the level of threat or the level of opportunity that is here in any given moment. And the person who is in their, their 40s, it has even more of that wisdom cultivated and a person in their 60s or their 70s, even more. And so what we know is that 
we have the opportunity to build the circuitry ahead of time. We don't have to let time be the determiner of the amount of circuitry that we have activated and turned on and 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 been able to then therefore utilize. Uh, it doesn't have to require time to do that because we are actually rooted in timelessness. The foundation of our being is not sus is not um, at the if effect of time. It's only the false self personality that believes that is true. And so, whoa, it's like, okay, how do we do that? We can collapse time by building more circuits ahead of time, ahead of what life would dish out for us. We can become conscious and intentional about it. And the next thing you know, we're walking around in our 30s with the wisdom of someone in their 70s uh, because the circuit, it's about circuits. It's not about time. It's about circuitry. Experiences bring us to building circuitry just by having the experience. Then we're familiar with it. Now we're not afraid of it. But we have other ways of building that familiarity and that tolerance or that resonance and coherence with all kinds of life experiences before we ever have the experiences. If we let that, if we if we lean into learning how that can happen. I love that. And we're going to have a chat about timelessness as we start getting into the conversation around healing. Um, I'm so fascinated. <laughs> the, there's a point there where um, you are going through your own journey and you start to, like you were talking about earlier, it's um, back to you for a sec, which is, yeah, it took you five years almost to sort of build the, it sounds as from what you're describing, the, the neurocircuitry to actually be able to support and anchor um, and embody, let's just call it what it is, um, the, the awareness of the energy that was coming through. And now I've heard you in certain different sharings sort of claim it as being like there's there's less sue involved there's more cosmic energy and for some people that's that like that sounds um like whoa i have to give myself up sort of thing uh so there, there can be some fear attached to that can you describe what you right. mean by that and what's actually yeah. going on there great great question um you know i should say sue becomes more of a cosmic being than the Sue that was the personality that was trying to manage everything and control it all and make it happen. I, I get on she board. She really tries, with, doesn't she? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so does Everett. <laughs> so do we all. <laughs> Come on, try, try really hard. Sorry, oh. I'll shut up. Please continue. <laughs> all right, you've got to focus more. It's not like that. It's, it's really about we don't lose who we are. We, we, lose a, we release attachment to who we think we are. And we begin to recognize, I am so much more than I thought I was. So it's about not playing small anymore. It's, it's more like that than it is, I don't even know who I am. It's not that. It's not that I don't know who I am. It's that I know exactly who I am. I'm available. I'm flexible. I am pliable. I am clear. I am potent. I have the power of the cosmos behind me. I'm animating that. And I get to do it in any way that I choose. And the higher my vibration, I make choices to steer and point that cosmic intelligence in whatever way I desire. The higher my vibration, the more I make choices to steer it into exactly the right thing that's going to be at the right time, that's going to propel whatever it is my project is into manifestation with very little effort, almost like no hands. Look, look, mom, no hands. It's happening. It's sort of like that. So... We don't lose ourselves, we lose the illusion of who we thought we weren't. The illusion goes away. I didn't think I was capable of this. Turns out I am. I never would have thought I could do that. Turns out I can. It's, it's that kind of transformation, not losing your personality in terms of one's charm or one's delight or what they love or, or those kinds of things. It's not that. It's just we're not dependent on those things for a sense of self. We're, we're much bigger than that. We can utilize those tools anytime we want, but it is, it's okay if, if a moment comes and goes where we were not, not able to utilize those faculties. We don't feel missed, looked over, left behind, uh, unloved. It, it doesn't happen. It, it turns out that those kinds of experiences are, are not real when we were experiencing them in our early years here. Hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec, but I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving my one-on-one -on -one coaching. 
So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more in control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emirate at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emirate, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www amrit.coach forward slash life that's www.amrit.coach forward slash l-i-f-e there is a link in the show notes below to book in that call and yeah if you want to take your journey further if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life if it's for you please do check it out and without too much further ado once again for your spirit for yourself today's podcast a random question is emerging in my head, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it, which is we're walking along on this earth and the opportunity is nigh right now for a lot of us to do this work. I found um, you, I'm quoting you from another uh, body of work that I saw you in, which was um, the challenges in the world we have right now are simply a byproduct of us, of our beings, basically um, holding on to how small we've individually play, been playing for so long. And um, yeah, in and around there, one of the questions that has emerged for me just literally in this moment is, as we're doing our work, because we all do occupy a certain place on the planet as well, right? Um, and I'm I'm visualizing, and this is probably, I don't know how appropriate it is to visualize this, but we're also like, we kind of look like these acupuncture pins on the body of the planet. As we go ahead and shift and open into the expanse of what you're describing in terms of the cosmic energies that are available to us and, you know, the personality being this sort of slit, um, does the, the energy flow on each of the pins, almost these acupuncture pins, that's the individual human, as that continues to expand and uplift and enrich, does that support the planet in terms of any planetary shifts that it's going through or am I extrapolating too hard there? Mm, beautiful. So, so it, it does serve, it serves the bandwidth on the planet that, that houses human consciousness. So the planet's going to be okay either way. Okay. You're like mother earth could burp and we would all be gone. You know, it's like that. It's like, she knows what she's doing. It's okay. It's big being been here a long, long time. That's got it going on. So what we are is, you know, these acupuncture needles on these little points. And what we're doing is learning to animate the space in between each of those needles. We're, we're learning to feel into that space between and to connect and to reconnect. And as we reconnect all around that grid, what happens is we are soothing and harmonizing with the planet, with Mother Gaia, with, with what's here. And as a byproduct of that, we are likely to make decisions that no longer cause her to suffer, that, no, that, that she no longer has to bear the brunt of what the whole bandwidth of human consciousness is not willing to take a look at. So think about Mother Gaia is the body of the whole bandwidth of human consciousness, just like our physical body would bear the brunt of the anger that our conscious minds were not willing to take a look at or to feel into and dissolve. Mother Earth is having to 
bear the brunt of the same thing of the collective consciousness that is not willing to take a look and be in their hearts and to connect and so forth. So the more we connect those needle to needle to needle, the more we start to harmonize for one another and we satiate this polarized, duplicitous way of being that humanity has developed by being too much of a driver and not enough of a feeler. And, and so what happens is we start to help each other. We start to help each other because some people are better at feeling than others so far. You know, we can, anyone can develop it. Some people are more resolved than others at any given point in time. Some people have issues of a certain sort where another person doesn't have that issue. They have different ones. So we help each other the more we start to connect with each other. And that one being that is surrounding the planet, this whole bandwidth of human consciousness, starts to uh, equilibrate. It starts to become harmonized and more of an alpha frequency that is the true nature of Mother Earth herself. So, so it, we stop hurting the Earth more than anything, right? So uh, then she can do her thing without us interfering. Then we make better decisions. We make decisions that don't deplete our resources. We make decisions that where everyone wins, including Mother Earth, including our natural resources, not without them getting used up because we're not willing to bring forth technologies for profit reasons and all that, all that other stuff that is mental body driven we start really, you know, collaborating, actually, turning into the truth of who we are. It's quite inspiring because it feels like a very virtuous cycle because obviously, you know, we were talking about neurocircuitry before as well, and we are such a product of our environments. Um, and as we support the internal environment and the external environment, then also shifts and the connections between everybody, and that basically forms an environment for us and our energetics um, as that continues to uplift. I think we're back to that square one where we were discussing the collective awakening that's currently underway. So I think we yeah. sort of come full circle on the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> the um, there's a whole from here the, the 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 questions naturally dive into okay how um, help <laughs> please <laughs> how do I start this energetic housekeeping because so far we've been discussing uh, many different things but what I've been hearing through the conversation thus far is a lot of this if we don't do our work in terms of our emotions in our body we end up projecting on our body if we don't do the work like on ourselves we some part of us collectively also starts uh, projecting on the planet and also a big part of life is just relationships it's so deeply woven into like our inter personal relationships and if we don't do our inner work we end up projecting on each other and so if we want to face the shadow work um do some of that like work through our unresolved stuff i guess the invitation then opens up in this conversation to how do we do the energetic housekeeping how we do well, well what you call awaken the healer within how do we do that mm. uh, many 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 things that we can do uh, one of the first things you you've mentioned is to is to really do our own work, but it isn't just from the head. We have to allow the mind and the body and the breath to work together because that's in the spirit of unification. And the whole idea is unity consciousness. The whole idea is no separation, no suffering, no separation. So, so when we do manage to unify, we start healing physically, we heal emotionally, we, we have a, a spiritual realization of who and what we really are and everything just begins to shift. So one of the first things that I like to encourage people to do is to understand the difference between being on the self and being on other with our consciousness. We either direct our photon density, our little tiny packets of awareness that we're made of, um, we either direct them internally or externally. And the majority of humanity is, has been directing them externally since they landed here and splatted and dispersed their resources and have been you know, separated out so our circuits are built to externalization. So we constantly think we're at the effect of that. So we're going to blame that if we're not okay. We're going to thank that if we are okay. And we're going to try to operate in a way that makes that like us so that we can remain okay and, and, and create happy things from the outside in in our, in our world. So, so what we want to do is learn the distinction between being on subject or being on object, being on self or being on other. And it's important to recognize that. So right now, everyone can just take take a look at something in, in the room that you're sitting in or 
uh, if you're driving down the road, uh, you know, you can you can do this too while you're driving down the road. You can take a look down the road and put your attention on a car that's out in front of you. Um, if you're in the room, just put your attention on something other than you, just in the room, something that's not moving. Um, and uh, notice how you feel in the body when you put all of your attention on that. You can even imagine that that thing that you're putting your attention on is someone standing in the doorway of the room that you're in who pushes your buttons, somebody who triggers you. And now, woof, all your energy goes onto them. It magnifies the effect. And so it kind of allows your mind to start to make distinctions. And then notice how you feel when you give them all your power. And it feels empty. It feels collapsing. It's like there's nothing. It's very vague. So now just claim that energy back onto yourself. Just pull it onto the self. And just really, literally, with your own conscious awareness, just just say, you know, excuse me, I, I gave too much of that away. So I'm going to pull some back here so that I can have this because it's my responsibility to have this. And so when we pull it back onto subject, it feels warmer, it feels whole. The longer you sit there on self, on subject, the more the vessel, the belly starts to fill and the heart starts to fill and you start to become aware of a sense of self. So that sense of self is going to allow you to make different decisions. It's going to allow you to think differently. It's going to allow you to have courage and confidence to step into whatever you want or to not let what someone else is doing affect you, to not get caught up in some fear-based way of interpreting life. Everything changes. Subject, object, subject. So now throw it back on object, throw it back on that person in the doorway, and then keep looking at that person in the doorway, but just call it back while you're while you're there, while you're there looking at them, just bring your consciousness back into your body. It might sound so simplistic, but I've had people come off of ulcer medications by that simple practice alone. I've had people uh, shift back pain that, that was there because they were constantly giving their energy away and there was none left over to do the healing and filtering and cleansing and digesting in the body that it is you know, intended to be doing. So subject, object, subject is a great place to start. And then the next thing I would do is have them anchor themselves there. And, and then there's a whole language that the body starts speaking. And, you know, if we, depending on where you want to go with this today, um, we, can, we can describe how, how to work with when, when we do get triggered and it's, already, it's too late, we're already triggered. What do we do? Um, and how do we let that serve us instead of, um, just trying to survive the moment as a strategy, but really to recognize it as that's exactly how life is trying to build circuits ahead of time for you. It's trying to do it. It's been trying to do it your whole life. But until you know that, you, you miss it. It just goes right past you. You know, it, it gets lost on your circumstances. So we'll see where yeah, you I'm happy. Go. I'm happy for you to take us uh, there. That's what's merging in the conversation naturally. Happy to flow into that. Yeah, please expand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... When we come back onto self, onto subject, the next thing we want to do is stay there. And so there are some anchor points that we can we can implement that will allow us to lock in. And uh, one of them is simply just kind of gently squeezing your shoulder blades together and dropping them down your back. By doing that, you anchor yourself in this heart space, and it allows the the brain of the heart. You know, cardiovascular cells are are known to have. Um, the manufacturing capacity for neurotransmitters and and uh, to process the information to actually have a, a brain. There's actually a brain function in the heart space. There's another one in the gut. This whole gut collective is is another area. And so there are some things that we can do to anchor ourselves down in the gut as well. It's similar to if you were if you were squeezing the muscles that you would have to squeeze if you were going to the bathroom and you wanted to stop the stream instantly, there are certain muscles that you would squeeze, okay? Just squeeze those muscles just a little bit and then hug those shoulder blades together and drop them down the spine. And then if you just roll your eyes up and look up, you can feel the muscle activity behind your eyes. Well, if you were to connect a line between behind your eyes and right into this heart space where your blades are connected, right down into the pelvic bowl, into the pelvic floor where you're squeezing those muscles, there's an elevator shaft right there. And if you would breathe up and down that elevator shaft, just inhaling from the from below the tailbone right into the belly, and then exhaling up through the heart and squeeze those blades, exhale up through the throat behind your eyes, exhale out through your, your crown, out the, the top of the head, then inhale from the top of the head behind the eyes, down through the throat, in through the heart space where those blades are squeezed all the way to the belly, and then squeeze those muscles at the base of the pelvic bowl again, 
squeeze those and exhale right down through them and into the earth, what starts to happen is we start to carve a super highway through an area that has filled with distortions and all sorts of stuff that we've packed down in there because of suppressing our emotions and, and so forth. And when we start to enliven this central channel in the body, uh, we start to enhance the highest vibrational frequency that the human body houses. It is the highest vibration. It's pure light in, in the deep core channel. Eastern culture used to reference this as the Shushum, or does reference this as the Shushumna. Uh, ancient Egypt referenced it as the river of life. And the whole of it is the, the bottom line version of you, the highest vibrational frequency version of you, meaning it's the one that is stable no matter what your mind is off here doing. It's the one who's holding the, holding the fort down when the mind is writing stories and getting all upset about things and, and when the body is freaking out, etc. So if we can get the mind on this, and be aware of it in the body. The mind and the body and the breath are now starting to work together. And together they are more. They are more potent, more powerful, more capable of transmuting anything. And so we can become literally um, capable of building our own neurocircuitry, carving our own pathway, uh, and allowing for this great wisdom to rise up through us in ways that are clear, that are truly un unstoppable. So then there's one last thing. When you're right there in that central channel in breathing um, and someone does do something that triggers you, instead of getting throwing your energy on them, keep your energy on you. Keep it on you. Keep it on the self. Stay on the self. Stay on the self. You will liberate yourself if you'll stay on the self. But we project onto other people so we lose the energy. We need that energy right here to have the power to transmute up through the primitive brain to the high brain centers. So you ask a better question other than why do you do this thing that upsets me so much? You ask a better question. Where in my own system could I build more circuitry to be able to uh, be in the presence of you doing that without it triggering me? What do I have to do in here to build, to build, to connect the dots, to connect these three brains together so that I'm potent in this life? And so your mind is going to go to some place in your throat, your chest, your heart, your gut, something. And you just hug that area. Just hug it and start breathing up and down that channel. And you're going to build some circuits and carve a highway really in between these three brains. And what happens there chemically, we alchemically, we, we transform ourselves and we start looking at life very differently. Like the whole of it is just opportunities for me to see where I need to build circuits next. And now I'm on to it. Because I'm realizing this whole thing, this whole life experience is in my favor. It's not against me. It's trying to show me the bigness of me. And so life begins to look very different. We, we stop avoiding things because we're afraid they're going to upset us. We, we just lean in. And we're capable of leaning in with love because this river is basically the vibrational frequency of love on a, on a very high end level. So I'll stop there. I just wanted to throw that in there since we were kind of in the neighborhood. <laughs> just <laughs> casually. Wow. What an incredible energetic anchoring. Thank you so much for that. And as you said, lean in, it does feel like a leaning in, but it, it feels like a, for me, it was more like a leaning back actually. And then yeah. opening up. Yeah. And it's just the wings of yeah. you almost kind of expand, even though you're locking your shoulder blades in and pulling your woolen, woolen harder yeah. up. Like that's amazing. That was yeah. incredible. Um, yeah, and even before when you were sharing about the, um, like, yeah, projecting it, like the exercise of projecting onto the other and bringing it back in and projecting it on the other and bringing it back in, it was quite phenomenal to just have this palpable experience. And this was just what was going on for me. It doesn't have to be what's going on for everybody else. Um, I'm conscious of being <laughs> absolutist in my languaging. Um, but as I was projecting on, it felt very like there was this fire to it, you know, there was this sort of grrr about it, you know, and there was charged as I was putting it out. But when I put it back on myself, it was just soothing, um, which was really counterintuitive because I think that's part of why I imagine in, in like inherently we sort of throw the charge because like I don't want to keep this charge, bang, like let's ping it out there, you know, somewhere. And so it's kind of intuitive to go, oh, yeah, that's charged. I'll flick it out there. I'll, I'll flick it back on you. And it's like, but then the experience of like actually allow it to flick out there and then flick it back on you and realize, oh, that was actually quite like, it was like a bomb almost. Like that's kind of trippy. And then realize that, you know, you don't have to be part of this like fiery sort of process. It can actually be way more yin and way more soothing. That was quite profound um, in and of itself as well. And then we went into the anchoring, which was 
incredible. I'm just marveling here, actually. <laughs> There's no question in that. <laughs> well, that's, what, that's what being in the body does, is it brings it to alpha frequency, which is, it has a balmy feeling. It has a, a salve feeling. And when we come back into the tissues of the body, there's such a liquid content, it really puts the fire out. If we'll stay in the body, you know, where the majority of the, of the human system is, is water and empty space. The rest of it is the minerals and the structures that hold us in this, in this function. But, but there is so much of a water content that when we bring our consciousness back into that, it's, it's really like if the fire of the consciousness, the light of consciousness is like fire. And when we bring it onto the body, it's like dousing the flame in a, in a, in a, in a vessel of water. And, and here's the interesting thing. When that fire of the consciousness comes into this vessel of water, it's like literally the steam that would rise is the spirit essence. It's like, it's really what the, the ancient texts were referencing as the Holy Ghost. It is that essence that here's the alchemy. Here's the byproduct of bringing the fire of your consciousness into the, the, the well-being of your body, which is highly liquid in content. Um, and the two combined creates the misty white substance that is known as the essence, the essential self that is the guiding presence of our lives. But most people don't have any idea about that stuff. So they're, so they're just, they're not able to utilize the benefits and we want to bring your awareness onto that because it's everything. It solves everything. It solves your temper, it solves your indigestion, it solves your sleepless nights, it solves your arguments that you're having in your relationships, it solves your unworthiness, your illusion of unworthiness, all of it. It's, it's all of that stuff is a byproduct of not being in the body, of not being in the body. You know, we came to the physical dimension, the physical body version of us has a lot to do with why we're here. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> the physical dimension. My ticket in is a physical body. I have to bring my consciousness and keep it at home. But this mind is just like, it's like untamed. It's wild. And it's constantly go over here and go over here and go over here and go over here. And it's like, yeah, give me here a second. Just sit down, plug in, and you'll enjoy the ride. And you'll enhance the ride by being here. And everything changes when we, when we train the mind to stay on the self and to learn what the self is made of so that all of these ingredients like the fire and the water and all that can become usable ingredients for us. All right, guys, this particular juncture, I just wanted to jump in with a quick question for those tuning in on YouTube. Please leave me a comment below. I want to hear what your awareness around your energy and energetic fields is. Like, do you believe in energy? Do you see energy? Um, do you feel energy? How's your relationship with energy? Um, and how is this conversation supporting you in your awareness of energy? I'd love to hear from you in the show notes below. Comment below. See you soon. Back to the episode. The mind's rightful place in and around it all. So in there, I could feel that we were um, giving the mind, directing it towards um, a greater current, let's call it that, um, and giving it a, an opportunity to sort of just rest in the awareness of the greater current. And it actually gave it an, uh, an activity to do. And you were alluding to it just before as well. The mind is sort of <laughs> all over the shop when it's um, not really given a task um, or put in its rightful place when it's trying to manage everything. <laughs> Poor little guy. He does a good job, but uh, he's just trying his, his, his heart out. <laughs> so right. many puns in all the terms. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a, the, the rightful place of the mind um, in and around all of this, because it can be such a great instrument in, in helping us direct the energies. Right. Um, and yet, it thinks it's um, it thinks it's commander and control of all the energies as well. Yeah, Can you describe that a little bit? It got a little bit? carried away. Yeah, it just got a little carried away. <laughs> right? Its job is to aim it, to steer it, to guide it. And once it had a few shots at that, it's like, oh, okay, I'm I'm the kingpin here, and I know what's going on. But the rightful mind's job, the rightful use of the mind, is to serve something greater than itself. It's to serve the soul. It's to be a part of a team, not not a dictator. Yeah. One of the questions that opened up as you were describing the anchoring process that we were feeling into and there's that current that we're going through our body and we really anchor it in. I couldn't help but um, have a question emerge in my field around the toroidal energy field. Your awareness around the torus shape and toroidal energy fields and potentially for some of those tuning in, this is the first time they've ever heard of such a thing. Um, can you describe the toroidal energy field and what's going on there? Sure. If you picture this unified field like the sky above you, 
and we were going to compress see all physical energy all physical matter is compressed energy you have to first let's like land on that all the chair you're sitting in is energy that's been compressed into physical matter called a chair the physical body that you're sitting inside of is energy that's been compressed into human form uh, the the thoughts that you think are energies compressed into a thought it's it's just everything is energy everything and it's just vibrating at different frequencies and we're walking around inside of an a huge energy reality and it's different compressions in different ways trees and rocks and rivers are, it's all energy ever all of it so so that's that's us inside of that reality and now if you think about the sky above you as the unified field for just a moment um, it's obviously bigger than that but this will just kind of give us a working analogy if you saw the the sky start to generate and compress itself into a funnel, like a vortex of a tornado, and then it would become a channel that descends and extends itself all the way to the earth. It hits the earth, and uh, in terms of our consciousness, the earth steps us down as from being this, we're made of this unified field. This is us doing this. That's how we come into this dimension. We funnel and then we channel and then we hit the earth. And then what rises up from the earth after the earth steps it down for into the frequencies that are manageable in this dimension that are relative to where we are. Um, I call it stepping it down for human consumption. And, and it rises as high as it can go. And as soon as it reaches its pinnacle with the amount of momentum that it has, it fountains, it like fountains like a, a water fountain that you would see in a lake as you're driving, you know, driving past some landscape in a golf course or something like that. And so it fountains around in every direction. And then consciousness is coming here. You as a conscious being, a conscious presence are going to take that energy up again and give it another go of shooting it up as high as you can go. And it just recycles and recycles and recycles. And so this energy is funneling and channeling and hitting the earth and rising up. And then it fountains out and then it gets taken back up at the tip of the spine, comes up our central channel and then fountains around again. And then it gets taken up at the, at the tip of the spine and it does that over and over and over. And it's constantly being replenished from overhead with more. It's constantly hitting the earth and rising up and contributing to this. And the more gaps in our circuitry we have, the less momentum this rising energy has. And so our toric field is small and a little feeble and not very potent. And if we build circuits across those gaps, the rising energy has more potential, more potency. It rises higher and the toric field gets bigger and it vibrates at higher frequencies, and we cover more territory, we can relate to more types of vibrational frequencies, <laughs> we become more empowered to heal things, to change things, etc. So that toric field looks like a big donut. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're here living inside the donut hole, basically. If you stacked up a bunch of donuts, that's, that's us. That's, that's really all that's going on. Such a yummy little experience <laughs> we're having from that perspective, and this um this is interesting because uh, on many levels, but also I've there was a bit of a a trippy dippy moment when I came across some of your work, and you were referring to us as because there's this massive conversation around you know ascension, and everybody's talking about you know there's a collective awakening happening, ascension, and yet you use the term that you know for us doing the work, we're like the descending masters, um, and that was it. Kind of was a bit of a flip. There's a few things that you flip actually, <laughs> um, but that was one of the flips where I was like, huh? And then it's the more I sat with it, the more I was like, oh. It's such a ode to wholeness that we are whole and that you know, we're, we're down here. Sorry, I'm programming the response. Can you explain descending masters and what it means to you? Sorry, I'm sure. <laughs> exactly where you were headed. That's exactly what I was talking about. So we're made of light. We know this. We're made of high frequency energy. Everything is. We're made of the same. And we are coming into this dimension to awaken to ourselves as that while we're here. And so a byproduct of doing that is um, we liberate, we feel free, and you know we experience ourselves as God, source, creators, unified, conscious, quantum beings, however you want to reference it, it's the same. And so we come into this as a gig to, to 
play and experience ourselves as creators, as, as generating life experiences, projecting a movie onto a movie screen and walking into that movie and what will I create? And that's really why we're here. It's what we're doing. But people don't realize that because they splatted when they got here. So, so when I say descended master, so we're made of the enlightenment that people are trying to ascend to. So there are parts of us that are here that are trying to wake up to that. And what I'm teaching people to do is to animate or identify as the energy itself that's funneling and channeling and coming in. So we understand that we've already, we're descending here into a body form to go out there and live a life that is based on the mastery of creatorship, not survivorship. Okay. So the problem is we landed, we splatted, we got here, but we splatted and we created a false, incomplete version of ourselves. And we started defending that version of ourselves because we're afraid all the time. So we're like, hey, don't mess with me. Don't tell me who I am. No, 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 no. And, and so people say, yeah, but you're kind of not nice. No, I'm fine. It's you. You know, we're just, we're just living in a crazy way because we're only experiencing a portion of ourselves, which begets fear. So the more fear-based we are, the more we're going to defend because we're trying to protect. So if you find yourself becoming defensive in a conversation or try, you're trying to protect something, and the only reason you would be doing that is if you're not really aware of your wholeness. Because if you were aware of your wholeness, you wouldn't need to defend anything. You would be fine. You would, you would not be threatened. You would be available to help this other person with whatever confusion they're having in the illusion. So people that are splatted are the ones who are trying to ascend. People who are connected are the ones that know I'm descending and I'm just training myself to rise without interruption, without distortion, without interference on the line and continue doing my thing. And I'm here to help you do the same. It's, it's more of that sort of thing. It's like we're in a game and people are taking it as if it's life and death. And it's not. It's a game. We are, in fact, eternal beings. And we have nothing to lose, but we have to action with reverie, with reverence. We have to action with, with a sacred disposition that it matters, that there's heart and meaning in everything we do, because that's how you win the game. And, and it's what we're really made of. So I love to talk about that stuff. So yes, we are a descended master, and we are rising into the full expression of that mastery that we already are. But people interpret it like I'm seeking, I'm seeking, I'm seeking. And it infers that I'm incomplete, I'm incomplete, I'm incomplete. And, you know, you're not missing anything. It's all here. But we're so busy looking for it, we can't find it. We can't feel it. Oh, so what does that infer about um, our relationship with the other side and life after death then? So you mentioned somewhat that it's, uh, yeah, you said reveries of the highest importance. So I will preface that in the questioning, but it's also a game um, to some degree. So there's an element of play in there. That I think that, that feels a little bit um, smoother for me to say. Um, but yeah, what does it mean for our relationship? What, what's the possibilities for our relationship with death? Because for so many of us, it's laden with fear. Mm. Yeah. You know, the number one illusion, the number two illusion is that we die. The number one illusion is that we're born. The truth of it is, <laughs> I love you. I love you. Okay. The, truth of it is, <laughs> the truth of it is, we are always, we are always. Spirituality has been telling us this forever. Our religion taught us otherwise, uh, which messed us up for a long, long time. Um, but quantum science is showing us that we're made of energy. We know scientifically that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, we're made of that. That's who we are. We can't be created or destroyed. We're just coming into a game and it looks like this is like we're born. And then we're afraid the whole time we're here that we're going to die. And the name of the game, the way you win the game is to realize while you're in the game that you're an eternal being and not to take it lightly. Because in order to win the game, you have to operate with the same kind of potency and sensitivity, the same kind of reverence, as I mentioned, as if it's sacred and rare and tender, and it needs to be, it needs to be loved and nurtured and, and honored. Uh, we have to operate that way with deep sincerity, or we don't actually accomplish what we came here to accomplish, which was to awaken as light and love while we're here. And so if we just irreverently go through, ah, I'm an eternal being, it doesn't matter what I do anyway, nothing matters. It's like, you're not going to win the game because you're 
polishing your mind, but you're not bringing your heart along with you. And when we overextend the mind far beyond what the heart is allowed to accompany, we create the imbalance that creates the suffering while we're here. It is a, a no fun game under those circumstances. Nobody wants to play. And that's why everybody's, you know, ejecting out, addicting to things, getting, you know, just, just projecting and, and not happy and not enjoying the quality of their life is because they're, they're out of harmony. They're not, they're not using their faculties in harmony with one another. And so that, that duality, that, that polarization causes great pain. So mm. there's, um, there's a point before where you were referring to um, the opportunity is for us to bring our energy back to self and focus back on ourself. And there is such a, like just if we could feel it in our field as you ran us through the exercise, it's like, yep, we were protecting on the other, bringing it back to the self. Just a little harebrained question that sort of dropped in was around self-obsession because there is potential for some people that are opening up to this work to just like, oh, it's all about the self and just, you know, to bring it, you know, to potentially be self-obsessed around the work. Um, any sort of um, little um, nudges to iron out any kinks that may emerge for somebody that may have certain um, propensities for, for such tendencies? Yeah, like narcissism, you mean? Yeah, right. Mm, yeah, yeah, not okay. too far off that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so we are way off of the self. We are way on to object, onto other in our in our tendencies. And when people feel the threat of that, they can falsely become narcissistic, self obsessed. It's all about me. I'm the most important one in the room, and that's a survival strategy. And, and so we know that it's fear-based because if we're not identified as the true soulful self, that cosmic being that has funneled and channeled and hid here and in the toric field and doing its thing, um, then any other identity that we would have is going to be fear-based, any of them. So it's sort of like we're way out here and we need to come in here for responsible stewardship. If we really ever want to find kindness, it can happen only when we are no longer a fear-based individual. If we are afraid, we're protecting and we're guarding and we're defending and we're arguing and we're warring and we're battling and we're winning or losing. And, and, and it has, so, so anyone who's willing to come back onto the self to some degree a greater degree than they are if they're experiencing fear or pain or anxiety or depression or or physical pain etc then they need to be more on the self and once we're there if it's done correctly and in an integrated fashion it will not become self obsessive and and not caring about other because when we truly enter this deep core central channel, it is only with a divine intention, a, a, a guided loving presence. It is to truly get in and vibrate as that frequency, you have to care. It has to be about all of us. It has to be the vibrational frequency of unity consciousness because that's what the channel is made of. It's made of unity consciousness. Think about it. You go up that channel and up that funnel, and there you are in the unified field. It doesn't get any more unity consciousness than that. So that's what has gathered itself and is presenting as this toric field flow that is rooted in its deep core center with the same unity consciousness that the universe, that the cosmos, that the whole of the manifest world is made of. So you can't get in being narcissistic. Not really. You'll just be a false self protective personality with a better language to speak, to convince yourself that all is well. And that is not what we need more of in this world. We have plenty of people in spiritual practices that are walking around saying all the words, but being spiritually competitive or comparing, I'm more enlightened than you are, or you're more enlightened than I am, and you know that kind of stuff. It's just not embodied. Yeah. Not embodied. And even as you were describing that, I was uh, the, what was dropping in for me was this, uh, like even just terminology, like a, a self with a uh, with a lowercase s and self with like a bigger case s, um, like yeah. a capital S. I don't know why I say bigger case, <laughs> La, capital, <laughs> capital S, and the capital S being the self that is like the modulated backed into the current, and it's got the the mind body breath sort of interconnected, and the mind has its place, and like having self like 
not say projected, but focused on that. Um, yeah, you know, we're in a really whole integral place um, as opposed to the little S, which is just the mind. I don't want to say just the mind, but just the mind focused in back on itself is that narcissistic. That was really helpful the way you clarified that. Thank you yeah, so much. Um, there's another question in there around expansion and contraction because you find this in spiritual circles a lot where we talk about expansion and this whole conversation today has been so whole week's ending. Um, it's been incredible. So in and around there though, some people have fear around expanding too much because then they're worried about their field, what they pick up, the openness of stuff and all this sort of uh, clammy bammy sort of things. So questions around that in terms of back to, I guess, what I call energetic housekeeping, touch wood, and maybe it's a term you like or don't like, I don't know, um, but it's neither here nor there. But the energetic housekeeping piece for those that are afraid of expansion, I know as soon as I use the word fear, I was like, well, probably the answer's in there <laughs> in and of itself. But, you know, there are that, that, is a, that is a palpable fear for a lot of people that do um, said work um, around expanding too hard, too far, um, and what their fields are, including t- touch wood, exposing themselves to and stuff like that. Touch yeah, wood. beautiful. So the universe... The manifest world is expanding, and I use the word anchoring because we have a psychological issue around the word contraction. So it's expanding and and anchoring, or expanding and anchoring, expanding and anchoring constantly. It's it's constantly pulsating in this way, and every expansion is bigger than the one before. And so, and it's, and a, it's natural, a natural rhythm. It's a universal pulse. People could feel this pulse uh, if they breathe in their belly and they open their heart and they just turn their hands upward like this and just kind of lay them just about an inch or two above your, your lap. And, and it's a pulsation that, that we can feel together right now. Let's just do this. Okay. So I'm going to trace it for you and track it. And then you just breathe in your belly and slow down your breath and soften your hands and open your heart. And it's pulsating like this. Boom. 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 Now, this is a measurable pulsation that exists in the developing embryo before there's even a heart to beat. It's not your cardiovascular pulse. It's a universal pulse. It's a cosmic pulse, all right? So, so if we are in tandem with nature, we're going to expand and anchor expand and anchor, expand and anchor all along the way. We will not expand too much, too fast, too quickly. Everything that I teach is about embodiment and building circuits. The more circuits you build, the more you ground and anchor the expansions that are occurring in your consciousness on your journey. So if people are taking shamanic journeys and doing all sorts of externally driven things and they're not doing anything to anchor and integrate and embody those expansions that they're experiencing then they are susceptible to picking up on things and not really being integrated and not and and actually becoming less functional in the world becoming uh more dysfunctional not even wanting to be here and just you know get addicted to you know another round and so so Everything that I'm interested in doing is teaching people how to anchor, embody, anchor, embody, integrate, infuse, because that's what it took me from these exalted experiences that were up in these Christed consciousness realms to bring it into my body was the only thing that I could do to function. I mean, I couldn't get out of bed. I was, if I lifted my head, I was in such a vibration and I was in so much bliss. If I just let go, I just didn't want to come back. It was for a long time. And so, so we don't need to, so I know what you're talking about. If you're concerned about excessive expansion without enough anchoring, um, it is, it is by nature and by divine design, you are guided. If you allow it to occur naturally, if you're pushing the river, trying to get that expansion and make it happen, now you're in trouble. You're off, you're, you're out of that harmony. The autonomic nervous system can't regulate, can't process what you're doing, and things just get haywire. And, and those are the people who have a difficult time. They have a bad trip or they have a bad time getting back in and you know functioning in life. And it's completely avoidable and completely manageable if it is already occurring with you. So so it's about learning to build the circuitry. And that's what I teach inside of my Live Awake program. It's this whole long year study 
program that t- people dive in and we live together working through this and making sure that we're set, which allows us to en- enliven and awaken and expand, but in a manner that's integrative and and healing and empowering and really propelling you forward in a way that that doesn't allow this very thing to happen. It's a great question. It's very important that we realize that that expansion is our true nature. Our objective is get in the body. Our objective is awaken to who you are and get in the body because that's why you came. You just hit your head on the way in and you splat it and you forgot what you're what you're supposed to be doing here. <laughs> I might be the first to put my hand up to say I probably hit it in a couple of places. <laughs> wow. So you mentioned um, the Live Awake program. You've also got a new program coming up um, shortly. Is that the Awaken the Healer Within that's coming That's coming up? Yes. We, uh, we have Heal Yourself, Heal Your Life that's coming up, and it is – um, it's a three-day fabulous time for people to start to plug in to details of how we do this and how we how we work with it. And and then from there, people um, have an opportunity to join us in the year-long program. But I want them to go through this introductory piece uh, before they before they plug in to the year-long program, just to make sure everybody's on the same page and you know and we can really get the momentum working together as a collective with people from all over the world. We're leveraging that kind of power from all over the world and coming together and supporting each other in this process, which is what we were supposed to be doing in the first place. But, you know, nobody taught us that. And we're, we're stumbling into it and figuring it out as we go. So it's a wonderful experience. But yes, heal yourself, heal your life. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'll put the links to that in the show notes below. And I'll use that as a bit of a segue to sort of say we've been talking a lot about um, energy medicine, energy housekeeping, as I call it. Um, And so from there, the the conversation around dis-ease, I think there's just a couple of stones left unturned in there because we've been talking about energy. And I think um, a lot of your work, that's like the the expanded version of part of it. And then there's also where people come to the work from sometimes is this place of dis-ease. And I think talking about um, how we can basically expand our neurocircuitry is uh, a vital awareness to have. And maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, and maybe for those that it's not obvious in this particular juncture in the conversation, how does um, all of this link into holistic wellness and us healing ourselves and, um, yeah, overcoming dis-ease? You know, it's exactly that. It's the same thing. It's same, same. When when the highest frequency energy on planet Earth comes into a body, does it make sense that that body would heal? It's a higher vibration. It disentangles the disruptions and the injuries and the and the old patterns that were there. And so and so it rearranges us and it has the ability to do that. That's that's the point. And so when we're interested in self-healing and natural health care and, and truly aligning and harmonizing ourselves, it's about allowing the energy that we're made of to do what it's built to do, which is flow. It has to move. The energy has to be flowing to have its, its ability to take away. You know, think of all the systems of your body. They're flowing. They're flowing uh, something. They're either flowing neurotransmitters or they are flowing digestion or they're flowing our immunity or our hormonal system is flowing through the body or our lymphatic system is flowing through the body. There's movement of energy in palpable, tangible manners in the physical realm. And the invisible anatomy is what's driving that. The invisible anatomy is an invisible physiology. The invisible physiology is the movement of this toric field flow. And if it's allowed to move, then the systems of the body move and do their thing and the body functions. And so if we injure ourselves, it takes the healing power to this area and so forth. If we are trying to create or build something new or strong, um, it's designed to do that too. But when we shut ourselves down mentally and emotionally, we shut down the circuitry that allows that energy to flow. And that shut down energy creates blocked energy. And blocked energy creates one of two things. On one side of the blockage, it creates inflammation. On the other side of the blockage, it creates a deficiency and a weakness. And so we injure ourselves and it doesn't heal. So on one side, we have pain and inflammation in the body or inflammation in the tissues at large. On the other side of that blockage, we have uh, weakness 
inability to heal. Energy's not getting here. No communication, no flow. I sprained my ankle. It didn't heal. I broke, you know, I broke a bone. It never healed properly. Or, you know, we hear these stories all the time. People come into our work and they start getting this energy moving again. And it picks up right where it left off because the body's designed to heal and it will do so if we don't interfere with its innate intelligence and inborn ability to do so. So we just have to learn there's no emotion that is worth trading your good health for by suppressing it. It's not a good trade. There's no thought, there's no anger, there's no angst that is worth holding on to if you're going to lose your health over it over time, and you will. That is the cause of disease. It is blocked energy, interruption in the natural energy flow. So it starts with headaches and allergies and asthmas and things like that, and it works its way all the way into chronic degenerative diseases that that lend us into, you know, debilitating circumstances. But it's on one continuum and it's all the same thing. It's just a matter of intensity and time. I freaking love you so much. <laughs> to this quote, there is no emotion worth suppressing losing your health for. Just it's- it's just an emotion, for goodness sakes, you know? It's just a feeling. I will never forget the moment that I realized, okay, I'm just going to face this fear. I'm just going to feel it inside my body. I am I am not leaving. I'm sitting in this chair and I'm not getting up until I'm able to look it straight in the eye. And it was a life-changing day for me. It was a life-changing day. I realized I can be in the room with fear. I can be in my body with fear. And I realized it's just an energy. It's just a vibrational frequency, and there's nothing that I can't open to. So I opened to the fear, and it disappeared. And I was like, ah, now we're, now we're on a different path. Now we're on a different it's, path. It's so profound to, to digress a little bit. Um, we had Gary Zukav, Seat of the Soul, on the podcast, and he lost his, um, his beautiful partner, and they've been lifelong soulmates and, and you know, beloveds um, for for the better part of many decades. And, um, you know, they in a particular juncture in the conversation, he was describing the pain of when she transitioned on and how it was so difficult to navigate and all the tools not uh, dissimilar to what you've described here today. Um, I think your work speaks more to the energy, whereas he's more about describing personality and soul and just recognizing that we are also soul, whereas you're actually modulating all of that experience to actually bring energy medicine through and help us actively heal diseases. Um, all of that to say he was describing just how painful it was and yet how necessary doing the work was to go in and confront all the fear and just I, I remember the transmission that was just pouring off him energetically in the podcast as he was sharing just the gravitas of the work that he did. And yet on the other side of that, you know, the things he was describing was, you know, it's it's hard for the mind to grapple with. It was like, you know, you had, an, you know, universal energy told him that, you know, you'd been funneling all your love into one person. You're still here. Now you get the opportunity to spread that everywhere. Off you go, you know, and it was just, he felt so healed and so whole. Um, but it was, it was difficult to look at the fear, even as he acknowledged it. And yet there is such a liberation on the other side. It's so, so beautiful. And it is true with our fears within ourselves about our own inadequacy or our own insufficiency, that everything that we were talking about earlier, about coming onto the self, anchoring in there, breathing up and down the channel, when we are feeling Uh, intimidation, that we aren't enough or that we can't do the thing or why isn't it working for me? All of those are thoughts that are just the same as someone else pushing your buttons. So we generate this within. And if we can sit and be in the channel and allow those sensations that come with the idea that I'm not enough or that I don't know how to begin or how am I going to do this without the help of this or that, uh, in the I, in the illusion of loss, what happens? I mean, it feels very real, right? But it isn't. It isn't ultimately real. Together, we are one. Truly, there is only one of us here, and we're having these life experiences where relationships and families and jobs and all of that. But it really, at the end of the day, we're going to know that it was all inside my own consciousness. That whole thing that happened, that whole movie that I just went through for a hundred years or however long we're here on the planet, and and so. If we know that, and yet we're still feeling the pain that we're feeling in those real rubber meets the road moments, just come into yourself in the way that you do in that are unavoidable in moments of great loss. And 
and be there for you? Like, where in my body do I feel this intimidation or this, this uh, hurt coming from? And it will take you somewhere in that channel, up and down your whole, your whole body, from, tip, from head to tip of your tailbone. And, and when you can just sit and hug and breathe and be with it, the mind, it's like the personality and the soulful self and the breath and the body are unifying. And when they do, something opens up. It's like, oh my God, I'm here for me. I wanted and thought that you would always be here for me. As it turns out, I'm here for me. And when that occurs, it, it's unwavering. It will never go away. It will never part again. And that's really why we come. We come to put it back together so that we can experience the wholeness of our being. And so in those painful moments when something has been you know, taken away, it it is it is because you are now ready to with and have developed the appreciation for the amount of love that you are how do you know because that's how much you loved that person and so that love is mine the love that i was loving them was actually coming from me so when i take that grief into the body it's going to take me to the place where i need to build the circuits so that I can have that awareness fountain through me in an ongoing, never-ending way. And that is the Holy Grail. That is the fountain of youth. It's, it's truly the eternal part of us that we're putting together. And, you know, it's really hard when it's out of pain of loss or sadness in those kinds of ways. But I always tell, tell my students that are coming in and doing the work that, that it doesn't happen until you're ready, until you can handle it. And it happens when you're ready, if that's what needs to happen in order to refine you and your tendency to attach or to, or to enmesh and to not allow the wholeness of your being to be known by you. And the pain that you feel is proportional to the love that you are capable of. So celebrate instead of grieve only. You know, let them meet each other. Let the celebration meet with the grief and process this in a truly deepening and authentic way. And you'll come out of it better uh, than you think, better than you were before uh, on a deep, deep level. You'll know yourself more fully. Wow. Our ability to open up to our pain is the same ability of magnitude that we can open up to celebration. Wow. Hey, you're Inspired Tribe. I want to take a quick sec, but I wanted to share something today with you that is really dear to my heart. And it's actually what keeps the entire ecosystem around the Inspired Evolution thriving my one-on-one -on -one coaching. So it's basically coaching that helps you live a spiritually aligned life. I coach people from all different types of walks of life. These people are leaders and they're looking to have an incredible spiritual impact in the lives that they're leading for themselves and then also lead in alignment to their values. Now you don't have to take my word for it. Here's a few people that have also transformed through my coaching and here's what they have to say. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. Then my corporate banking job wasn't really doing it. You feel like you're not making progress towards your goals. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. I'm more in control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emirate at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and really I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emirate, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. As you guys can see, there's a lot of people all over the world from all these different corners experiencing incredible transformations. I don't think, if I can say humbly myself, that there is anything quite like this somewhere else online. Most people that you know have channels that you know grow and grow and grow don't really focus on one-to-one -one offerings. I have just found that it is the most profound space where you can bring yourself in a private container and really just share what's going on for yourself. And if you want to book in for that call with me, touch base, it's www.com amrit.coach 
forward slash life. That's www.amrit.coach forward slash L-I-F-E. There is a link in the show notes below to book in that call. And yeah, if you want to take your journey further, if you want to dive in deeper and you really want to live a spiritually aligned life, if it's for you, please do check it out. And without too much further ado, once again, for your spirit, for yourself, today's podcast. There is some rapid fire questions to close off the podcast. I can feel us coming to a natural close. However, there was something I had promised the listener earlier on, and it was the conversation around timelessness. Um, And I think in the energy and healing conversation, it can be well it can be i think it is extremely profound um the concept of this eternal now and the quantum stuff the, the awareness of the quantum that you share um through everything with the mortar institute can you describe the timelessness and potentially then also describe like how regression therapy kind of work? like yeah just how what like time doesn't exist and then how does healing how does that inform and cap- uh, capacitate our healing abilities yeah so think about this channel and then these layers of the toric field that we've been talking about. And when you get to the outermost boundaries of that toric field, once we get the toric field expanding, because we've been anchored in here in this channel and building a super highway that has more momentum to shoot that toric field in a bigger way, then the outer layers of that start to access really high vibrational frequencies. And we reach a place where those highest vibrational frequencies are actually taking us out of the time space continuum. We, there are part, there's a part of us that exists beyond time. And so actually I might have a little image that I could hold up here and show. No, my not this. Yes. All right. Here's a very simplistic little drawing here, but this is very helpful. So that toric feel flow would be flowing uh, along the lines of what I'm describing here, uh, like through this, here's that toric field flow. For those of you that are visually watching this, this is all becoming the channel, hitting the earth, rising up, cycling around and around and around. And when we don't have the circuits in place, that energy descends, hits the earth, rises up, and has to start avoiding these gaps in the highway. And that wobbling avoidance of the gaps creates a distortion in the field. And now we're standing here looking out through that distortion and we see a distorted reality. We think it's true that we're not enough and, and so forth. And so, so if you were to take this and take a snapshot of it, each of these layers of this toric field rounding around the outside of the body, they have a higher and higher vibrational frequency all the way out. So I'm going to switch to this other image here. That is just kind of a snapshot. So this would be the layers of that toric field coming all the way out. So all the way out here is the timeless version of us, completely timeless, completely present, eternal one, always been, will always be. It chooses to come in to this dimension, to embody. And so as it does, it, it compresses and compresses and compresses and compresses and compresses itself right here to about this halfway mark where the image is. And that very first green line that you see right there is actually where space and time are perceived. Out here, they don't exist. In here, they completely rule, okay? So everything from here in, we are controlled by space and time and gravity and on those laws of nature, the way that we've learned them. But out here, we're subject to cosmic law, not natural law. It's bigger than natural law. So this think of it like this is inside our atmosphere, this is outside of it, okay? All right? So, so when, when we start to awaken out here, there is more of that traversing through that toric field system over and over and over again. Our timelessness is contributing to the vibrational frequency of this toric field flow. Our timelessness is contributing. You follow? So that's what's running through your veins is a timeless version of you, an energy frequency that is so profound and so pristine that it's made of heaven on earth, all right? It's the same. And so that's what allows us to truly begin to perceive our internal presence. That's why I'm building circuits for people to allow them to awaken to the higher vibrational frequencies so that more of that can be contributing to the toric field flow and running, traversing through that central channel, which is turning on all those chakra centers, those energy centers. It's turning on all those levels of consciousness and we're waking up. So it's a matter of systematically approaching it. Now, healing happens because outside of this 
layer where time and space begin, the perfected field exists. It doesn't start getting distorted until we get to this layer here of the red. That's the mind, the mental body. It's the mind that messes stuff up, okay? Now, the mind can also heal stuff, but it, it has to be used differently than it was being used when it started messing things up in the first place. Okay? As we've been so, describing this whole podcast, yeah. Yeah, okay, right, that's it. So, so there's a version of us that needs to be traversing through our toric field flow that allows for... Uh, the timelessness to contribute to the healing because outside of space and time, you're already whole, you're already healed. It's already done. So we have to wake up to the version of us, which knows that it's already done. And then the physical body has no choice, but to respond because the physical body is the caboose on a train. And wherever that train is going, the caboose is going to go. So we want to wake up at the engine. We've been living in the caboose wondering why life isn't good and things aren't working out and we're so victimized and everybody else has power over us and you know the outer world has the say so or whether I'm having a good day or not. And so, ah, uh, caboose is not the fun place to be sitting. Let's go up to the engine and see how fast, how slow we want to go. Let's see which 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 route we're going to take and and a byproduct of that is the caboose will go along. So when the consciousness awakens, the physical body is at the effect of our consciousness. So we know that we've all worried ourselves into a headache or a stomach ache before. So we, we've experienced that, that, that mind-body relationship. And so we have to allow the mind to be vibrating at a higher frequency, to become aware of higher and higher realms and realities. And the way to do that is, in a stabilized manner is to come into the channel because that's where the highest vibrational frequency of you exists. It's higher, deeper. And, and that's something our minds are like, no, it's not higher, deeper, it's higher up and out. But it, the same thing that's up and out is also here in this channel because that's what you're compressing and made of. So find the channel and you'll find your own personal laboratory version of the whole macrocosm and be able to do something with it, with the dashboard of your body and the feedback mechanism that it is. So, yay. Yo, I love the uh, the ode to the deeper self. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. Some rapid fire last or closing questions as we wrap things up. What is your definition, um, Sue, of a of a living a good life? Of living a good life. Wow. Knowing, feeling, feeling, knowing, and actioning, being the true divine presence that I am in all situations. The ideal life would be there is no situation in which I am not expressing fully as the divine, cosmic, unified, field, quantum self-being that is based in love and connection, integration and collaboration. Something like I love that. that. Thank you. How do you define God? God is the I am. It is the presence. It is presence itself. And it is, it is a... Uh, the unified field, uh, it is based in love. It is creator creating creation. And uh, we're made of that stuff. What is the ultimate purpose of life? Life here on earth. The ultimate purpose of life here on earth is to awaken to the eternal life that we are. How do people find you? <laughs> DrSueMorter.com. It is D R S U E M O R T E R dot com. It's our website. We're on social and YouTube and all that as well. And always offering lots of things, complimentary things that people can participate in and uh, little challenges along the way just to stir it and wake it up. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a big three day event coming up. And, and so it's a, it's a great place to start as well. And I can highly attest to, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel, um, the stuff you're sharing regularly, um, your lives as well. And it's just, it's beautiful to also get just what's super current um, in your field and in your world as well as you're sharing it online. So I'm really grateful for that personally and encourage others to check it out as well. I'll put a link to your YouTube channel amongst everything else we've discussed in the show notes today. Is there anything left unshared in today's podcast that you'd like to share further? Mm. Nothing broken, nothing missing. Nothing wrong. You are whole and complete as you are. It's just a circuitry issue. We simply need to awaken to our magnificence. Dude. Just that. Yeah. Dr. Sue, 
<laughs> if it wasn't obvious already, I am such a big fan of your work and just what you embody and the way you carry yourself and the light and everything that you're championing in the world. It is such a pleasure and a treat to have you here sharing this here with us today. So obviously, massive thank you. And yet also it's a lifetime's worth of work. Like you said, 60 plus years of you having dinner table conversations to inform the incredible juiciness that informs this entire conversation that we're having today that we get to stand on the shoulders of. Thank you so much for sharing yourself so openly, so abundantly here with us so clearly today. I'm just super grateful for you. Thank you. My great pleasure. My great pleasure. Thank you for what you're doing to bring people together. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. You made it all the way through to the end of another incredible episode. This conversation with Dr. Sue Morda, if you loved this, please don't forget to like, comment, and hit subscribe on the channel. Now, also, if you are watching this right now towards the end of the episode on screen right now is another conversation that we had with Dr. Sue Morda that goes deeper into her origin story and how she became uh, Dr. Sue Morda, an incredible conversation around energy codes as well. So the actual book, we turned it inside out in that conversation. That conversation is on screen for you to check out now as well. We also mentioned an episode with Gary Zukav. There are another couple of episodes on screen right now for you to continue your journey. Stay inspired, keep evolving. I'll see you in the next one.